Today's show is brought to you by the Davenant Institute. We'll hear more from them later on in the show. Welcome back to the Ironic Protestant Podcast, a bi-weekly show where we strive together for the knowledge of God, his word, and his world through the lens of the classical and confessional Protestant tradition. Uh, we're stoked to, uh, for today's episode. Uh, you may notice that we have uh, two people that look unfamiliar to y'all. Uh, so there's one person that's more important, one person that's a bit less important. So we'll start uh, with, the, with the lesser first and work up from there. Uh, so today uh, we have our my good friend, James Derryberry on the show. Uh, James is uh, another student here at RBC, and he was actually my, uh, my, my, one of my first roommates here at RBC. He's, he's a dear friend, was one of my uh, groomsmen in my wedding, um, and uh, he's also he's a great looking guy. So, Derryberry, could you introduce yourself and uh, tell us what, we do, what you're doing on here today? I'm honored to be the less important guest. I'm, like Jonathan said, a student at RBC and very interested in classical Protestantism, reading and reform scholasticism. Uh, currently a member in the OPC pursuing ordination. There we go. There okay. and planning on attending Westminster Theological Seminary in the fall. There we go. Okay. That's good. So good fun thing about Derry Berry is so um, my experience in my in my youth group was I was the I was the theology guy. You know, I was reading uh, all of my stuff, listening to my my crazy podcast, and going to my Baptist youth group talking about Reformed theology. Um, but I was also like, by the end of it, uh, high school, I thought I was really the bee's knees. And I was also like super into like the Federal Vision theonomy crowd. Um, so like I was reading a lot of James Jordan, Peter Lightheart. And so you know, first day, first day meeting him, you know, I finally met somebody that was not only smarter than me, but also like beat the Federal Vision out of me. So that's that's a good times how Derry Berry that freshman year just having conversations about issues um, regarding you know the imputation of Christ active obedience which we have no hope without um, so Derry Berry is definitely a, a dear a dear friend to me so he's on as a co-host today uh, helping us in in the interview Josh would you take it away from here yes um, and our more important guest is Tim and Klein he is a jurist doctor for the state of New Jersey correct yeah I'm a, I'm a deputy attorney general in New Jersey yeah. Okay. Um, you're a graduate of Rutgers Law School, correct? Yep. Um, and also Westminster Theological Seminary. And he is here to talk to us about Protestant political theology and its relationship to natural law. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about yourself, Timon? Sure. So, um, so I grew up in the SBC, actually. Okay. Um, my dad's an SBC pastor. Uh, they were, I grew up overseas. Uh, my childhood was in West Africa, where their IMB missionaries came back. Um, so I was in the SBC until, I don't know, four, four years ago or something like that. Wow. Um, so I'm in the OPC now. The OPC got me when I was at Westminster. Um, I moved, moved out to this area to do law school and uh, ended up doing seminary along the way. Uh, so I finished both those up in 2020, right here in COVID stuff which is pretty anticlimactic, but uh, sure, yeah. they basically one day just told me not to come back. And that was <laughs> it. Um, so, yeah, so now I just work as a, as an attorney, but I, I'm also a fellow at the Craig Center um, for the Westminster Standards at Westminster Theological Seminary. Uh, it's run by Chad Van Dixhorn, if you guys are familiar with him. So I'm doing mm-hmm. some work there this academic year on uh, mainly on Thomas Goodwin but it's part of a, a larger project on Puritanism and natural law. Um, so yeah, I live in Philadelphia. That's pretty much it. Married, awesome. no kids or pets. That's it. That's awesome. Nice. Well, to, to begin our discussion today about uh, natural law and Protestant political theory, could you give us a quick uh, definition for natural law and what you mean when we say Protestant political theory? Sure. So um Natural law, uh, I, I think that if, if you guys have, are familiar with, um, I think it's, I'm going to forget their names now, David Haynes, Andrew Fulford, Fulford, I think it is, uh, their primer that they've put out with Davenet recently has really good, um, you know, we, we can do kind of a, a, a Thomistic definition, but theirs is, is much more suited to us. 
So it's basically the, the eternal law with a creaturely referent, right? So it's the law, the eternal law is nothing but God's essence himself. Um, and it's that condescended to uh, his creatures. Um, and so what he reveals to them, uh, certainly empirically in nature, but mainly implanted within them. Um, I like to draw out when talking about natural law, the uh, commentary tradition, uh, not beginning with Aquinas, but certainly there all the way up through William Ames talking about, you know, it's the natural law is embedded in something they call the synteresis. We don't really have a word for it, but it's a um, part of the reasonable faculties and it's untouched, right? Even by uh, the fall, it survives. Um, and it's what the conscience refers to when judging actions. Um, but it is there. It's God's law implanted. But there's also an aspect of the natural law, and you'll see this really well in John Owen or Johannes Althusius, something like that, where they'll talk about the, the important secondary conclusions of those first very general principles, um, in a sense, have to be learned. And those are learned best by um, both good laws that already reflect it, as well as the traditions and teaching of the church. Um, so there's, a t there's two aspects to it. Some of it is just in everyone. Um, it's, it's communicated to them. Uh, I think the best commentators would say by a certain kind of mediation of Christ as the Logos, um, maybe not equally to all, but to all to, to some extent. But then there's another aspect of where you have to learn it, of how to apply it and how to draw the right conclusions from it. And so it's the basis for all uh, further positive or, or human law um, and justice itself. Um, so that's natural law. A Protestant political thought, or how, however you do, what, what phrase is used? Protestant I think political theory. theory. Okay. Yeah. Same difference. Um, you know, maybe a bit more uh, squishy on how we, how we want to get there. Um, but I would say it's simply, you know, uh, to, you're not supposed to use the same words within the definition, but it's political thinking um, informed by, um, you know, not only Christianity, but a distinctly Protestant Christianity and uh, bringing your theology to bear on um, the art of living together, as Althusius would put it, the symbiotics of uh, what make up society and um, determining how we are to interact in accordance with um, justice, both to each other and justice to God. That's, that's really helpful. Um, and I think to like give background for part of this conversation too, is, you know, the standard education that I think most people have received in the public education system is that, you know, well, this Protestant movement is one primarily concerned about, you know, soteriology and scriptural authority and mm -hmm. those sorts of things without realizing there's like a whole Protestant project for society. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what we're getting at with the idea that, you know, Protestants, they weren't just trying to reform the way we do church, they reform the way how we do society as a whole and how we, how we live together. Um, so yeah, that's, that's super helpful. Yeah. I really appreciated that you brought up the distinction between primary and secondary principles. Um, I'm part of the URC, so I'm not OPC. So a lot of the stuff that I read is just continental stuff. Um, Franciscus mm -hmm. Unius, who mm -hmm. you mentioned in your lecture at the Davenin Institute that you didn't know that Frank Juan de Jong and Francis Cassinus was the same person. I was in the same boat. I was like, I thought there were two different people. Uh -huh. um, but Johannes Polyander in his disputation on, in the synopsis of pure theology makes that same distinction, mm -hmm. primary and secondary principles. So I guess a question that I have, um, and I guess just narrowing our definition since we're reformed, so it's reformed Orthodox um, Protestant political theory. One of the points that you brought up not that you brought up, but over text is that you want to distinguish from Luther's view of two kingdoms, but the mm -hmm. idea of two kingdoms, obviously with the work that David Van Druen is doing, you know, doing great stuff, just getting um, Protestant lay people acquainted with the conversation that the reformed Orthodox were having. But obviously I disagree with his conclusions, just this two spheres, two sphere stuff. Um, can you talk about what is the twofold reign of Christ and what influence does that have on the reformed Orthodox Protestant on their political theory? Yeah. So this, this is a big topic, right? Because we're dealing with not just the ideas themselves, but reception and then not only reception, but our, you know, however many degrees of separation we have now uh, in the 21st century. And I think, um, I think it's Robert Krauss, in his book, uh, Two Kingdoms and Two Cities, talks about how all of our 
political thought, certainly political theology now is, um, you know, kind of mediated through the post-Christendom that, that we now occupy. Um, and that has not only become descriptive, but now uh, proscriptive and, um, you know, virtuous to a certain extent. Um, so the problem with a lot of secondary literature you'll read now about, you know, what Reformed or Protestant political thinking is, is conditioned by the, the place they're in, which is in, inevitable. But I think um, some of the, the curation of the source material is skewed. And then some of the reading of, of the source material that is used is skewed. And that wouldn't even include Luther. Uh, it would include Calvin. It would include Zwingli. So our, our very basic, you know, three big guys of the magisterials. And then, and then certainly when you get into, um, you know, the, the early modern period, the post-Reformation reformed, um, I think there's even some movement away from the magisterials. And so now you have even a, a more complicated situation. Um, but what I would say about two kingdoms for Protestants today, the, the basic idea is I think it is um, a good idea, but it's overused and misappropriated beyond what it's supposed to actually do. Um, so I think the predominant um, position you'll encounter amongst even, even fairly, you know, well catechized, generally informed Protestant people um, is that this somehow the two kingdoms idea uh, somehow corresponds to church and state. Um, and that's simply not the case in the, the, there's good secondary literature over the past uh, couple decades that demonstrate this in Luther, but you can read Luther himself. And that's simply not what he's really doing. First of all, two kingdoms for him is a, um, I think William Wright makes the point like a, a worldview. I mean, it's doing much more than talking about uh, social order. Um, but it does have implications for that. Um, and all he establishes is essentially a, you know, visible and invisible realm distinction, a duality there, um, where the, the invisible or the purely spiritual is directly governed by God, and that's in man. But then in the external realm, he situates both church and state, right? So this is all of human life, all human institutions and authority. And Calvin does the same thing. The church is within the external. It's in um, the, the temporal, if you like, uh, and Zwingli is perhaps even stronger on this point. So, um, I think there's a lot of misnomers out there with, with two kingdoms and misuses, um, because we take it, to, we kind of import it into exactly the, uh, demands of current debates and try to use it to satisfy that. There's certainly plenty of material in our tradition to address the, the current debates, but it, you can't just do the, this one-to-one -one kind of uh, comparison. Um, so what I would say is when you get to um, the actual questions we're interested in, which are aspects of social order, they're not questions of, is there an invisible purely spiritual realm where God is a total Lord over the uh, you know man's internal life and he owes all of his duties to him? That's great, we all agree about that. What do you do when you're talking about organizing uh, a polity? Um, and that's much more um, granular, but it is uh, certainly addressed by uh, the, the Reformed as, as well as Luther, but I think we can even get better than that. Um, and what I would say before, I won't go more into it in, until we uh, discuss, but I would say that the, the Reformed, the, the Protestants coming out of the 16th and 17th century are in, almost entirely conventional. They're making slight Protestant adjustments uh, in terms of authority um, and how that's going to look. You have the emergence of the, the real questions in the 17th century are between Erastianism and what we would now call uh, integralism. That's not a term they use, but it's only a question of which of the two powers is supposed to be uh, prioritized. And that's really the only debate. The rest of it is entirely conventional. And so to, to try to get in touch with our tradition, you do have to step back behind modern innovations in political science or thought um, and try to get into the, the situation that they find themselves in um, and how they generally view society, which is um, the, the best phrase for it is, you know, there, it's the Christian communion. That's your starting place. And then your various powers, however you're going to delegate or distribute labor are two species of the same genus. Right. So there is, it's a very organic view and we just don't think this way anymore. So this is part of the, our difficulty in, in getting into 
um, our tradition, but it, it can be right. done. The source material is all there. So, so um, let's talk about uh, the the let's start about talk, sorry let's talk about starting like a, a society in a social order. Like, mm. What's the end of of civil government? What's the end and purpose mm. of a magistrate, and how does that affect the end yeah. and purpose of a society as a whole? Yeah. So you know the the first premise you should have. Um, if you're, if you're reformed, uh, if you're generally Christian up until like yesterday is that government is good. It's not just a restraining mechanism, although it does do that. Um, but that even in, in paradise, there would have been something like government because you have reasonable creatures that relate to each other and, uh, you need some, uh, th this is an ordered relating, right? So this is part of, um, even what Adam is establishing. And so you would still, even if we were in paradise, need to have traffic laws, right, to govern the, the they can be considered arbitrary, but you need some kind of governance of how we move about uh, as to not harm each other or something, you know, that rudimentary. But you're, you're going to have something like government because this is a reflection of God. So it's not just a result of the fall. It's not an, a necessary evil. It's a good. Um And so then you have to talk about, well, what is it, uh, as you said, what is it ordered to? Um, and we'd say both both powers, but the spiritual being the, the church and the, the temporal being the state, are both ordered ultimately to the glory of God. They receive their um, authority directly from God. Therefore, they have to be ordered to his justice and honor um, and his glory. Um, but they, they have distinct immediate ends, right, in the here and now. And the government is going to be uh, focused uh, primarily with man's temporal good. Um, the common good of uh, all that are, are contemplated by the rule of a given regime. Um, but the, the key here is that man is not just flesh and blood. He's also a soul. He's body and soul. Therefore, the magistrate necessarily has some kind of concern with also his eternal end, with his soul. Otherwise, he's not governing men. Um, and this is something Vermeule takes up where he says, you know, if we're going to say as some people do that secular, he puts it in square quotes as, and puts a parenthetical, as some people say, um, if you're going to go the secular authorities that have no concern over um, man's spiritual and man's soul, then they're no more than a, sh than a uh, I think he calls him a pig farmer. He's an archaic word for a cow farmer. He has two things. So that, that meaning they're dealing over with soulless things, things that are purely temporal, but we know that's not the case. Therefore, the magistrate has to have a concern for the the highest good also of all of his people. That may be, you know, it's, it's not um, immediate for him. It's, it's a, uh, this is primarily going to take the form in most uh, commentators of saying you've got to therefore up, uphold and support not only true doctrine, but the church that promulgates it. Um, so it can't, he can't do it alone. He can do it by his example as well. Um, but this requires then the church. If the magistrate is charged with the soul of men, but that's not directly his uh, within his competency, therefore he has to have something to do it for him. Um, so you're going to support the church. You're going to promulgate laws that uh, reflect its doctrine or support its doctrine. Um, and this is how you're going to get at caring for the souls of your people that you're, that God has charged you with. Uh that's, that's really helpful. What about um, suppressing false religion? So, you know, mm -hmm. original mm -hmm. 1647 a chapter on civil magistrate in the Westminster Confession does talk about it's also the role of the state to suppress false religion. Yeah. What do you what do yeah. you think about that? Yeah. So this is this is very standard banana stuff in the, the Westminster Confession. Um, they would say, you know, this is still with the view um, that it's, it's worse to tolerate a spiritual death, uh, or spiritual attack. And so, uh, heresy, oh, you know, they're going to make a distinction between, uh, people that, you know, we can't get inside people's brains. So you can mm -hmm. hold a heretical view. We're not going to go around with inquisition style to figure out, you know, exactly what you think, but it's when you start openly promulgating it, um, and you even see this in, in New England in the 17th century. It's when people repeatedly refuse to abide by, um, you know, sanctions both from the government and the, and the church over and over again. It's when the Quakers won't stay banished. They just keep coming back. And they're like, we don't know what else to do with you. So now we've got to express this. But 
Um, so this is, you know, this is a more brutal time worth we're talking about, but they would unequivocally, all, all the reformers would say, yes, that is a, a duty of the magistrate to suppress false doctrine, uh, heresy, because this is um, both for the final end, it's bad for man. And then for the immediate end that the magistrate is directly in charge of, it's destabilizing. Um, and you even see this in late uh, or mid to late 19th century American case law. We'll talk about when the predominant religion is Christianity, open blasphemy is destabilizing um, and therefore is punishable. So um, you have blasphemy cases in this country up through the, the 19th century, um, as well as dishonor of the Sabbath. Both those things are bad because even if you don't care about Christianity and true doctrine as such, most of your people do. And you have to respect that and protect that. Otherwise, you're going to have chaos. So I think you mentioned the, the, this is a good this is a good quote from Baxter. I'll, I'll read Baxter's based and he should always be read. Um, this gets at your question, not only about whether you suppress false doctrine, but whether you can uh, provide what I would say are coercive conditions. So you don't just suppress the bad thing, but you also are trying to promote the good thing. Mm -hmm. Right. So Baxter said, this is in the Holy Commonwealth. I think this is standard. Baxter just says it the best. Um, so the magistrate cannot force men to believe, love God, and so to be saved, right? We can't force salvation. Yet they must force them to submit to holy doctrine and learn the word of God and to walk orderly and quietly in that condition till they are brought to a voluntary personal profession of Christianity and subjection to Christ and his holy ordinance. So Baxter's view is that um, you know, you can't, you, of course, force people to have genuine faith. Uh, what you can th do, though, is make it very, very difficult to, <laughs> to act <laughs> any other way. Right. And eventually, you know, this is almost kind of the, the Pascal thing of like, go pretend it's real for whatever he says, 60 days or something, and then see what, so see what you feel like. Um, so he's saying, you know, this is, um, and I think the, the main point here for uh, Protestant political thought is all of this first and foremost is a matter of duty and justice to God. So it's not about, can we emanatize the eschaton? It's not about, can you forcibly convert people? It's about what does God deserve? Because he's the one who's given you the power. Um, and you're supposed to be caring for these people. And if true doctrine is to true doctrine, you have to both protect it and promote it. It uh, doesn't mean you get to be tyrannical, uh, but you can't, uh, you know, suffer the outright licentiousness either. I think that's helpful because I think uh, many times in modern debates about these issues, it gets really wrapped up in the eschatology debates, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're an mm -hmm. amillennialist, then therefore you must, you know, hold a more, um, we'll call it escondido, you know, two kingdoms theology. And if you're, you know, you, yeah. you, know you, you have to be a hardcore, you know, theonomist and try to, you know, institute the Christian state in order to emanate the eschaton. I think it's helpful, you know, setting the categories of like duties to God and duties to neighbor. And that's what grounds our political theology and not necessarily the, the eschaton. Um, yeah. This, you know, what you're saying right now goes against the grain of, you know, most 21st century Protestants. I remember, you know, my, my upbringing as an American was our American system was great and plurality is good. And, you know, mm -hmm. let's, let's vie with the Muslim next door. It's all, it's all good. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember when I was in high school, you know, I was at the time just coming into Reformed theology and I was listening to a lot of the, you know, uh, the theonomy guys, which are very libertarian and it seemed their view mm -hmm. of the state was it's a necessary evil, very Jeffersonian, right? And, you know, it, uh, and I kind of was at the point where I was like, you know, anarchy is probably ideal, but we'll get there once the world converts. I was very post at the time too. And then that's when I uh, stumbled upon some covenanter material at the time, Gavin Barris, he's a he's a he's a minister in uh, the Free Church of Scotland. Continuing, did a whole series on the establishment principle, mm -hmm. and my mm -hmm. little you know junior junior high school got radicalized about the establishment principle. But um, and I'm not sure I hold to all of the the covenanter you know uh, basis behind all of it. But the the, the point being brought up though that what does the scripture teach about the church and the state and how the state is supposed to be that nursing father and nursing mother. To, to the church, but what would you say to, you know, the Protestants today that come from a, a viewpoint of, you know, the state's necessary evil in plurality is good. How, how would you say, no, actually what our traditions given us before is the superior and better thing. Yeah. So 
yeah, I think, I think your story too is that, that of a lot of people, uh, that, that kind of progression. Um, the, uh, the, the two, as far as I know, when I was there, the two establishmentarian and establishmentarians at Westminster were me and the librarian, Sinley Finlayson, uh, who's a, a covenanter. So we had, a, we had a lot of fun with that, but, um, it's very, it's certainly the minority view, right? Even amongst Presbyterians. I mean, this is not just a Baptist thing. I mean, I mean you mentioned Westminster West earlier. Um, they're, they're doing some, you know, stuff with the, with the source material that's good and other things that I think are over accommodation to, uh, 21st century advancements that are just not, uh, in line with, with what was actually said. Um, to say, I, I mean, I, I do think there's an avenue or an opening for some of this thought now more than ever, just just by, uh, you know, our, our situation, which is this great, um, you know, kind of fervor over questions of justice and o- over, um, you know, political morality. I mean, th- this is what the social justice movement is. It's all concerned with um, these, these aspects. Um it's very, you know, skewed and a bad view of a lot of these things, but the fervor is there, the, the enthusiasm is there. And so I think presenting it as this is not a question, like um, I said before, of ushering in any particular kind of millennial view. We're not like fifth monarchist or something like this that um, think we're, we're doing something more. And, and neither did uh, most of the Puritans, by the way. They think they're perhaps slightly instrumental, but they're, they don't really think that they're going to single-handedly bring this about as pre-millennial, as, as post-millennialist, right? Um, or what we call them now. So I don't think any particular eschatological view is intricate to having a thoroughly Protestant uh, understanding of political theory. I think that's a sideshow mostly, even though, as you said, it's, it's front and center with most of the uh, most popular uh, views of this, or at least most uh, predominant kind of default views, but I don't think that really matters all that much. I think it's mainly a question of justice to man and justice to God. And scripture is clear on, uh, as well as the, our commentary tradition of what we're pulling from our confessional tradition, it's very clear on what, how these roles are defined, come what may. And, you know, our, our favorite theologians, they're not stupid. They understand that, that everything is not always great um, one of my favorite texts on all of this is the uh, discourse about civil government uh, by 1663. The authorship is in question. This is me and Stephen Wolf's debate. Uh, I, but John Cotton writes this, and um, I mean, he talks about he has this great, you know, very pristine view of these uh, using Junius a lot, using a lot other Continentals, saying you know these are to be coordinate states in perfect harmony mutual support, all this stuff. That is awesome. But then he comes down to it and he's like, but if, you know, if you don't have this option, uh, you do have to default to the advice Apostle Paul gives you of uh, when you're an, an embattled church in a hostile regime. Um, so they're, they're very, I think, realistic, but their point is when you do have the choice, when you do have the option, will you not honor God with your polity? Will you not um, set up true justice, not just to each other, Um, of each man getting his due, but God also getting his due. And this is, um, you know, necessitated by the source of all this power, how you're going to wield it. If the power is coming straight from God and it's for these particular ends, then it has to be honoring to him. And is it honoring to tolerate, um, you know, false religion? Is it honoring to tolerate false doctrine? Again, they will be very prudent. They will say the chief virtue of a statesman is to be prudent. They get into the reason of state uh, kind of tradition and reaction to Machiavelli, which still allows for um, a large amount of, of uh, prudential kind of moves to preserve the, the state. That's your first and foremost kind of goal is to preserve your, your rule. Um, so they'll, they'll say, you know, some, not every, Aquinas says this, not every sin can be stamped out. You don't get to, and you can't mass, uh, you can't frog march people into the church, all these kinds of things. Um, but we, it's very important, I think, for Protestants to at least have the ideal in mind, which, which they can, from which they can work. And I don't think we really have that now. I don't think we have a coherent vision for what good social order is, um, even though it's, it's sitting there. I mean, all, all the stuff I, I pull from is all facsimiles in English online right there. 
and no one really uses it. So um, it's there. We got to make um, adjustments for our own historical contingencies, for prudence, all these things. But we at least need to come, uh, come about with a, some kind of coherent vision for what society should look like if we had our way, I guess you'd say. Richard Hooker is often known as the father of Anglicanism, but his is a legacy that demands to be claimed by all Christians, and especially all magisterial Protestants. His magnum opus was the laws of ecclesiastical polity. At the heart of this work is Book 5, which is dedicated to a point-by-point -point defense of the Reformed Catholic liturgy of the Book of Common Prayer. Although more than four centuries old, many of the issues that Hooker addresses here like the role of music and worship, the importance of visible symbols to accompany the spoken word, and the pros and cons of written prayers, remain as relevant as ever in intra-Protestant debates over worship and liturgy. And at the center of Book 5 is one of the most beautiful and powerful little theological treatises in English-speaking theology, as Hooker gives his account of the Christology and sacramentology that should undergird our worship. This summer at Davenant House, join Richard Hooker scholar, Dr. Bradford Littlejohn, for a deep dive into the riches of this classic text. During this five-day intensive course, students will read through the entirety of books four and five of the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, in which Hooker gives his defense of English public worship. Students will also discuss key passages in depth with an eye to historical contextualization and contemporary application. And of course, every day will be framed by a celebration of morning and evening prayer according to the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, so that we can not only learn about the liturgy, but live the liturgy together. This summer intensive course and a few others will be hosted at the Davenant House, the Davenant Institute's beautiful campus in Landrum, South Carolina. The yearly labor cost for this course, if you sign up before May 13th, is $375, which includes airport pickup, meals, and lodging. If Richard Hooker isn't your thing, then check out the other exciting summer intensives at davenethouse.org. Davenant Hall is a refounding of the ancient university for the digital frontier, grounded in the wisdom of the classical Protestant tradition. That's helpful. That's helpful. Yeah. Were you going to say something, Jonathan? Oh, I was going to say James has been brooding there for a second. Looks like he's been thinking, but yeah. go, go ahead. <laughs> Actually, I've been thinking, yeah. So I have a question okay. earlier when you were framing yeah. the debate of early modern political theory. You said the two options were really between Erastianism and then bringing in this mm -hmm. modern term of integralism. Could you expand a bit on the distinctions between a Romanist political theory in mm -hmm. the early modern period? as opposed to recent Roman Catholic integralism and any sort of Protestant integralism, early modern or contemporary? Yeah, so let me, let me do it this way somewhat. Um, I don't think the distinctions are as big as would, would usually be assumed. And I'm quite happy, just like a good early modern, just like your Samuel Rutherford or whoever you like, to rip off jesuits or whomever we can find for stuff you like and just take it you, that is our prerogative they don't get to do that we do um their their uh, allegiances preclude them from ripping off protestants ours don't um so if you look at early modern sources they're fine this, this is something mark jones who i did a seminar with always says if you're an early modern scholastic you can cite Gandhi, Mother Teresa, whoever you want, as long as it's good and true and useful. And just make your distinctions. Uh, you know, George Gillespie does this. Great text in Aaron's Rod. I mean, he makes concessions to Arminians. And he's like, Grotius is right about this. You know, whoever's right about that, they're, he'll make his footnote if they're wrong about this other thing, but they're absolutely right about this. So I think there's... Um, Per usual, at least since the 20th century, the Catholics have beat us to the punch on many things, bringing back um, pre-modern ideas into political thought. And the, the modern kind of integralist uh, uprising enthusiasm, what do you want to say, is, is a good example of that, of where um, I don't think it's a distinctly Catholic view. Of course, you make your adjustments. We don't have a Supreme Pontiff in, 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 integral to this... Uh, this vision, but their basic ideas of, you know, um, what, what would they say? So 
you know, man, uh, or his, his final end is not detached from, you know, our political considerations, these kinds of ideas. Um, those are just pre-modern. These are, these are, they don't own these ideas. Um, and you find them all throughout, um, early modern, uh, reformed scholastics or whatever you want to call them. Um, so, but one thing I would say about what the reformers do in the 16th century is I do think, even though they are um, continuing to use very conventional ideas about social order, I do think that they are returning to the Pope St. Galatius's, uh, you know, duo sunt letter, the two powers, the two swords um, in the, whatever it is, fifth century, sixth century. Um, that basic formulation, I think they're returning to that in over and against the innovations made by Boniface much later, which invested in the church, at least originally, both swords, both powers, which are then delegated to the civil power or the, the temporal power, therefore always capable, at least in theory, of being recalled or directed or whatever. So the state is always exercising its coercive power on behalf of the church and this kind of thing, right? The, the reformers, I think, self-consciously reject that. They don't like that. But what they're going to say is both of these powers get their power immediately from God, and they're not dependent on one or the other. But since they both get it from God, they have to somehow um, coincide. They, there can't be an antithesis, a radical antithesis to get the Ventilianism in there. Um, this just can't be. That That's ridiculous. There has to be some um, way to accomplish harmony, at least in theory, um, so I think they're doing that. I think they're returning, and, and this is not just me saying this. Other other scholarship says so. Um, I think they're 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 skipping back over again. A lot of what the reformers are doing in many areas is rejecting late medieval innovations that they're bothered by, and I don't think political thought is any exception. Um, now, what you do, I brought up the Erastianism aspect. What you do move into then, because of this. Um, is a question, um, certainly, uh, you know, we could describe Luther's vision perhaps as Erastian, kind of anachronistically slightly, but certainly in England is where this huge debate is, right? And um, there's Erastians on both sides of, or all three sides of, of the, at the assembly, um, but it's predominated by uh, the, the lawyers and parma parliamentarians, just because they have a natural urge for administration, I guess. I don't know. But, um, you know, so the question is, what, what, is, what role does the, the highest magistrate play over the church? Um, and obviously, they, they don't really win. I mean, they, the parliament rejects some elements of the, of the assembly's final document uh, for this very reason, wanting to kind of leave this door open. Um, but they, you know, this, this basic Erastian view um, in the end, may we could say triumphs, because this is basically what we have in the modern scenario uh, that w we now occupy, which is uh, ultimately the, the state is, has the priority over and against um, the, the spiritual power. Um, and this has been in some ways accomplished by diluting or pluralizing uh, the source of that spiritual power with the multiplicity of churches. And so no establishment. When you have no establishment and you have a highly individualistic religious religious liberty maximalist view uh, that's inevitably what happens so the the integralist project in, in terms of the the uh the spiritual power being highest and prioritized just as in the body soul analogy um you know is, it would be very difficult to accomplish but i think it's useful for recovering early modern uh, or pre-modern ideas about how these things should be organized and i think even within um, Protestant regimes that actually existed, there's still a sense of subjection of the temporal power to the spiritual. And you see this through the laws, right? So if um, the problem is with the Escondido guys, where they want to bifurcate the, the tables, right? Bifurcate the Decalogue, which no one ever did before. If they want to do that um, and say, we'll see the state can only, it has natural law, as everyone does, and therefore they can handle the second table, but not the first table. Uh, the problem is classical natural law theory would say, well, the first table is also demonstrated. So what do you do now? The other problem is what 
would have been said previously is, okay, but men are really bad at interpreting the natural law, especially in the secondary conclusions, and are really bad at applying it. And so God's given us scripture to help us with that. And it's also given us the church to help us with that. So the state needs the church in order to even understand natural law, because it is the it, it is in charge of preserving the deposit of truth given to it. Um, so the state uh, can't exist without the church, actually. I mean, Baxter calls a commonwealth that only has it that's purely civil with no uh, established church. Like he calls it basically a corpse. It has no soul. So it's not a man. So it's not a real commonwealth. And you get all this personification of the commonwealth in somewhat an Althusias, certainly in late 17th century guys like Pufendorf for this very reason. Um, so the, the polity, the, the commonwealth is always supposed to mirror the anthropology that you assume um, and that you're supposed to govern by, and it's supposed to be a reflection of, of the man um, who's a, a microcosm of the same thing. So um, I think that gets somewhat at your question, but I've kind of lost what the original question was, but that was, <laughs> there it is. You can ask it again if I didn't get at it. <laughs> Well, I think it brings up another point of the authority yeah. of the magistrate circa sacra and concerning sacred mm -hmm. things. And with respect to the mutual material subordination of church to state and state to mm -hmm. church under their respective formal aspects, mm -hmm. I, your quoting of Baxter and reference to him again just now made me remember about two years ago when a particular Baxter quote from the Christian directory was getting thrown about mm -hmm. a lot about the state prohibiting the gathering of churches during times of plague. And it was interesting seeing how people lined up on that issue. But could you speak to just mutual subordination of church and state, and then maybe then the magistrate's yeah. authority over church matters insofar as they are materially civil? Yeah. And I'll just go ahead and call out who did that because it was Brad. And I wrote a pretty lengthy piece. Where was it? At Founders or something like three parts, just basically saying, read the full Christian directory, because this isn't quite how it works. Um, which, I mean, Baxter's, Baxter, fair enough, Baxter is tough, because Baxter is doing a lot at one time. But um, that, you know, that's, it's not, it wasn't as easy as a case as it was presented. And that quote was thrown around, not just by Brad, but a lot of people. Um, so, but what I would say about the mutual uh, submission, or, or this kind of, um, you know, ideal harmony, is that you know they need to have a, a proper recognition of the immediate competencies of each power. The we would even say the legislative competencies. So the church has laws. The church has coercion. That's what church discipline is. Um, it it is coercion. It's not just persuasive, in my opinion. Um, just as the state does, as both persuasive and coercive power. All laws do this. Laws do coerce you not to steal but they are also persuasive. We don't want you to not just steal because you'll get in trouble. We want you to realize that stealing is bad. And that's what all laws do. Um, and if you don't believe this, look at, you know, um, laws that are, are mainly, I would call them ceremonial or something. I mean, look at Obergefell or something like that. Every state was already passing these laws, but we need the stamp of approval through a uh, the, the proclamation of the magisterium, if you will. Um, and there it is. So, this is simply how law works. This is one of the great insights of the, of the Catholic integralist um, is to say that this is simply how every society works and how, what laws are supposed to do. Um, so both, both powers need to have an understanding of what the um, me, immediate legislative competency is and, you know, endeavor, I guess you would say to not exceed their proper bounds. So the, you know, people like certainly a Baxter, but, Many, many other people are going to say, of course, you know, we don't want the, the magistrate um, formulating and propounding doctrine. That's not their, their role. Uh, what we do want the magistrate to do is when he recognizes some kind of dust up over doctrine that's now seems bothersome, we want him to call a synod and we want the synod to decide and we want him to affirm it. Right. So this would be the proper way to, to kind of work these things out um, because the magistrate cares about the peace of the church but he can't directly solve all these problems now. And this just goes back to, to the Constantinian kind of vision of what, uh, what he does, right. Calling essentially a, a council or Senate um, to, to formulate doctrine um, for the bishops to take care of this. 
Um, but that's a that's a good example of recognizing the proper um, competency extent of of rule and mutual help, mutual support. Um, now, last thing I'll say is there's there are interesting texts such as John Norton's uh, book, which is going to be the 1640s uh, or maybe 50s. And John Norton's in New England, and he's kind of providing this official response on behalf of people there to Holland um, at their request. And he gets into this issue and he says, because he believes in this Christian communion and believes that they're um, th this mutual, you know, kind of coordinate support. Um, he says there, there could be hypothetically a scenario where the church becomes so corrupt, the magistrate has to step in and, and restore it to its last, like, point, whatever that is, of, of good doctrine and purity, and vice versa. So there's that. He doesn't work it out enough, but there is that out there, and other people say similar things, uh, or at least hint at it, um, which would be, you know, very interesting to see what that would mean. But they, the point is, they really do go all the way when they're talking about mutual help and support. Um, the only aspect of submission or subjection, I would say, is when it comes to the doctrine promulgated by the church, which then all rightly ordered societies should submit to in their laws. So that is where the submission comes in because it can't go the other way around. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. Okay. Um, if, if I could, if I could ask this question then, d does this then not assume that uh, really uh, an ideal Protestant state only works when there's a single ideal Protestant church? So it only works in a society where there's actually a shared common confession and, and creed. Like you can't have a me can you have a mere Protestantism with multiple denominations and have any form of Protestant integralism? Yeah, this is the problem for the ironic yeah. Protestant uh, podcast. Um, you know, there, <laughs> there, in in the simplest answer is is like yes, basically, kind of. Um, but on the, on the other hand, no, because there's also a lot of um, talk about different models and, and certainly how different. Uh, I, I think most Protestants at the time being products of the 16th and then 17th century think the nation is the ceiling uh, uh, as a political order. So there's certainly interaction between nations. That's great. I mean, Baxter wants like a international Protestant federation or something like this. Um, with each church being respected in its establishment and how it's going to, to go. Um, the, most of these guys also will, t will talk about their, you know, having a healthy view of what toleration would look like. But I think to, to get at your question, at the end of the day, you do have to choose one organ of, of doctrine to have some definitive rulings because you will need this mm -hmm. at some point. Um, the, third or final option would be maybe what was originally tried in uh, in our own country um which is something like a a protestant federalism um and having very localized and state establishments um that are able to relate at a national scale without violating those um but at some time the, the rubber meets the road i mean i i don't think radical disestablishment people can really jive with a lot of this tradition. Um, you have to accept it at some point, yeah. Could you elaborate on how the, the, early, uh, the early Republic of the United States had mm. a, a, a sort of uh, Protestant integralism? Because I think the narrative yeah. that we're fed, we're fed nowadays as well, you know, most of the founding fathers were all, were all deists and enlightenment right. dudes. And, and you know, yeah. um, so they, they, they intentionally wanted us to have like religious pluralism to the max. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we're fed. At least that's what I was fed in my public high school. So what would right. be the counter narrative? What's the true narrative? Yeah, true narrative, the deeper Protestant conception. Um, <laughs> this is what I was fed. And, well, I wasn't fed anything at all in public high school. I don't know what we talked about. Um, but, th but this is, you know, what, th there's several problems with the, you know, early America and the founding era that we don't have to get into. One of those, though, would be, um, looking to, you know, the capital F founders, these, and, and then you, you choose like four or five, like your favorite guys. Um, and you kind of tailor your, your vision to whatever their, their writings were. Um, and then maybe even if you're a conservative kind of originalist in your 
jurisprudence, you just look at the Federalist Papers, which like aren't philosophical treatises. So I don't know what we're supposed to do with them on this front. But anyway, the point is very limited uh, approach to the material, um, but then also no no appreciation for like the background, the colonial background, um, or the structure itself. Um, and it's simply a matter of fact that the the background to most of the colonies is is thoroughly Christian, even if you have um, such as like in in Pennsylvania or more pluralistic areas, um, you you have multiple denominations, but then you also have somewhere like Massachusetts or Connecticut um, that don't disestablish till the 19th century, right? So you do have some differences, but all of them are Christian differences. And so one I'll always point out is like in, even in the New Jersey constitution, which didn't really have an Anglican establishment. It was kind of weird. Um, in the original constitution of New Jersey, it's got this great, uh, I think it's chapter or article 19 or something talks about, um, you know, general respect for like conscience and worship and these things. And then the very next article is like, yeah, but you can only hold office and do all the, everything else if you're a Protestant. So it's like, you know, Basically. this is just a, this is a difficult thing then to figure out what they're for, for the, the popular narrative of like what's going on. Um, and then certainly in all the, you know, everywhere that maintained their establishments and maintained you know, parish taxes, all this kind of stuff. The point is the the general organization at the time, uh, the, the federal constitution mirrors, um, I think good scholarship would say um, a sort of international treaty, which they, you can see some of this actually in the federalist papers where they're surveying, um, you know, uh, Swiss states and all this kind of stuff. And what it's doing is recognizing there are pre-existent polities, maybe even nations, we would call them, that somehow have to fit together. Um, and there's a multiplicity of denominations. So what we can do is not bother their establishments. That's what the establishment clause actually does. And then and say, we'll leave those alone, but we won't favor any particular one. Um, but we all know there's a funneling up aspect. And so if like you can't get elected in Connecticut, unless you're a good standing member of a congregationalist church, we kind of know what they're going to produce to the federal level. And this is going to maintain not only those local and state establishments, um, however they may be, but also a generally Christian, you know, national, national polity as well. Um, so I th the, the federal constitution, certainly before, it was uh, incorporated to the states after the, the 14th Amendment, which, you know, the Establishment Clause, technically you could have had an established church until 1947 based on the, the federal jurisprudence, right? It's not incorporated till then. If you wanted to do it, you could have. Obviously, political will is not there. But that's the point is these are most of what we think about the organization of the country and its background or 20th century developments and really Supreme Court dicta that then kind of get imported into our own self-conception. So it was a very interesting idea to try this, the civil war necessarily. So uh, I think stunts a lot of this, it was not tried as, as well as it should have been, but the basic idea is Christian people, generally Protestant, some of which have state establishments, even those without state establishments have heavily Christian laws, such as Sabbath laws and all these kinds of things. What could we do to avoid the wars of Europe? that we've seen in the prior century, this is what we're going to try, which is basically, uh, you know, this, this federalist view, which itself is a very Protestant idea. So, yeah. Well, boys, we, we not, tried, yeah. we tried, but it we gave really it a good shot. Out, but, you yeah, know. We gave it a good shot. Yeah. That's my, I've, I'm writing some more on this now. I mean, it's kind of, a, that's, it's not, uh, it's not that exactly cogent yet because I'm not done writing, but this is the basic idea is there's, there's something there and, and we've missed a lot of our own, uh, Protestant heritage here. Is um, that the even form of an article, front. an article series, a book? What are you doing the writing for? I'd love to get my hands on that whenever you finish. Yeah, yeah. Some some of this will be in articles, article series okay. uh, that have been okay. asked to be written. I'm just slow. So okay, awesome, yeah. awesome. Yeah, I, I anyway. think one point that you mentioned in your paper, like two twenties, um, really enjoyed that paper. Yeah. Um, is a point that Thomas Pink makes that all societies mm. are integralists. It, it mm -hmm. gave me a new perspective, like, okay, it's not whether, you know, whether we can get our society to be integralist, all societies right. are integralist. It's not a weather question. It's what is regulating their integralism. So if you yeah. can expound on that point a little bit more, I think it'd yeah. be very helpful. 
yeah, Thomas, Thomas Pink is great. I think he's the best. He is a Catholic. He's at King's College, London. Um, but I think he's the best kind of exponent of, of a lot of their views. Um, and his, his point, which you're bringing up there, is that is in certainly in our laws and in, in our policies generally, um, there's got to be some moral center uh, that stands back of it, some uh, orthodoxy, really, that has to inform the, the ends the law is pursuing and its vision of justice and all these things. And so there's always a um, really a, a church, really a priesthood that is inform- that is supplying the moral meaning that then is uh, manifested in laws. And this is just inescapable. This is how people work. This is their, um, this is what societies are really for. I th- um, something I wrote the other day at American Reformer was pulling from Nathaniel Chipman, who's a, a guy in the early Republic here, but he has this great bit about how the conscience itself, us being reasonable creatures with a desire for justice we need other people to have this idea of approbation, to have this justice. And this is what drives you to society. You need both approval and disapproval. Um, this is what pulls you, you know, into relation with others. And therefore, that leads you to this, this same idea that there's always got to be something that's driving, well, how do we define what that is? And, you, and these are fundamentally religious um, moral questions. So every society already has a, an establishment and you should just look around and figure out what that is. And it doesn't take you long. Um, mm-hmm. So the, the, the kind of frothing at this idea that there is a, there's an establishment would be good and that a fully integrated society where church and state relate well, that, that reaction to that is just a reaction from the, the liberal myths that have been promulgated for, you know, a hundred years about this, uh, this possibility of, of pure neutrality um, and a pluralistic, uh, you know, Jeffersonian kind of existence that even if it was possible, which is clearly not, uh, we were supposed to think it was desirable. Um, and that's just not the case. So I think what Pink's doing there is a very realist argument, in my opinion. He thinks it's also normative, but um, is just to point out, yeah, you already know this is, is true. Um, so now the only task is to figure out how to, what to do about it, what your what decisions you're going to make as a society. Um, I think an, an example of this already existing terrorism, I think you may have brought this up in your lecture to Davenant on the, the Puritans in New England, but like mm-hmm. blasphemy laws, right? Technically, you know, blasphemy yeah. laws don't exist anymore, but they do, right? If right. I right. if I decided to be a teacher maybe in Boston and I was like, hey, guys, you know, if you're going to be a man, you have to have an X, Y chromosome. And that's the way it is. Like I could get, I could yeah. like, get in trouble and lose my job for the public education system because I right. spoke the blasphemy and insulted the God of, of yeah. the secular state. Um, so I think, yep. I, yeah, I think it's, it's a great point that there has, well, you guys, to, there is you a- guys are on Florida. You see this now in, in your yeah. state, right? <laughs> this right. is going on, right. right. This is a great example with DeSantis's exactly. you know, bill and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. This is a great example of this is this is a blasphemy, a blasphemous bill. Um, and so so you're going to have a, a massive reaction to it. Uh, it's violating the the central religious core of the polity. This is, you know, the, an argument could be made that everything is actually totally fine structurally in our polity. It's just that the substance is wrong because that's actually the appropriate reaction to have when blasphemy is is. Uh, you know, espoused, it should be quashed. Mm-hmm. That's just how societies work at some level all the time. Uh, the, pro- the only, pro- but what we've, what we've convinced ourselves in, it, even as political conservatives, um, is that there's some way around that. And so the real problem is you're not respecting someone's right to hold and promulgate blasphemous views. It's like, no, so, so you've totally missed the ball and uh, other political actors have not, and they've made sure to now establish what blasphemy is. Um, so I think that, uh, again, from our own tradition, the, the Protestant tradition, insofar as it um, talks about these things, which it does, many sources do, it's um, not only prescriptive, but it actually helps you interpret the world as, as it is and just understand this is, this is not something to uh, to fight against in itself. What, what you have to fight against is the substance. And that's mm-hmm. where the battle is. It's not over the procedural mechanisms, really. 
Absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's really, really helpful. helpful. Um, so we, we, yeah, so we actually, we need to start wrapping up now that we could, we, I mean, this conversation go on for so much time, but we're coming, we're coming <laughs> to a close, but I thought I'd give Derryberry another opportunity. If you had anything else you'd like to ask. Um, I think if we're wrapping up on time, I think that's sufficient. Okay. Well, yeah, uh, I have one more question. Yeah. Um, so I believe that our beloved editor, Jonathan McKenzie, will link your work in the description below. Mm -hmm. But who are the guys you mentioned, Baxter, Holy Commonwealth, Franciscus mm -hmm. Unius? I'm, I'm, I believe you're referring to his mosaic polity, mm -hmm. um, John Cotton. Um, who are the guys that are available to us? I know that there's early mm -hmm. English books online. I saw your tweet that you live on there. and You know, my friend oh, yeah. James as well lives on there. Um, but who are the guys, who are the sources for those, you know, watching at home who you know, want to understand what the reform tradition have to say about the civil magistrate, who are the guys you would recommend? Yeah. So in, in the spirit of the podcast, I, I guess I have an eclectic uh, kind of assortment of, of guys I always look to or think that are, have really good text. So Mosaic Polity, definitely one. Uh, Junius is not just because it's good. Um, and I wrote something using it to, you know, he just, anachronistically speaking, totally takes down the theonomic idea for the right reason, right? Which is their view of law. Um, so he's doing that. It's very useful for that. Um, but also just because everyone else cites him all the time later in these contexts, right? Um, and then Mosaic Polity itself is just, it's, re it's, well, it's not all that readable, but it's short. So just give it time. Yeah. Um, best, one of his best lines to wrestle with is, you know, in uh, it's in the first 20 or 30 pages where he just says it's the, you know, the job of the magistrate or the king to lead his people to the eternal gates of salvation. Mm. So people just mm. figure out what that means for, yeah. for, uh, for us. But Mosaic Polity is great. Uh, yes, I love Baxter's Holy Commonwealth. Um, already mentioned Cotton. Um, I've been using for something else I'm writing recently, revisiting some Vermeule and his loci. He has great sections on the Christian magistrate that I think are very representative um, of what other people are thinking and doing. Um, the one I, one I finished recently is uh, William Prynne had a really good uh, tract on, on this issue. I can't remember what the data or, or uh, title was, but it's, it's something just on the, the sword of magistry or something like that. Even though he's an Erastian, all the, all the, mm. most of the stuff he's saying, is very standard um, mm. on getting away just from those questions of the, the power of the magistrate and religion. Um, you know, the basics are always good to use. So I think I've talked to, you know, Matt Pearson about, uh, he started reading Althusius, his Politica, um, which had multiple editions. So I can't remember what the original publication date was, um, but Althusius is a great place to start um, to get your, get kind of into the milieu um, so is of course, Samuel Rutherford. I think, I think the Lex Rex should be read by everybody. Um, just cause it's a, maybe even just, maybe you could even make the Shakespeare argument on that of like how important it is. Just, wow. you just have to read it. Um, it needs, needs to be in your, um, in kind of your personal corpus. Um, and then I do spend, I mean, I spend a ton of time with the new England guys. So I do read a ton. I've, uh, one of my articles last year was all just a survey of their election sermons. Mm. Um, where they every year in May, when they would elect their members of the general court and the governor and the, the assistant governor, deputy governor, um, they would have a sermon and it was like a big honor to do this. And we have a lot of those um, and they're really good. I mean, I, I, so don't read my article, but go, they're all online, almost all of them read, you know, New England sermons from the 17th century on election day. Um, and they give you a lot of this and they're, and they're meant for lay audiences, right? Like the whole town is there. Um, so those, you just have, I mean, it's, it's digging. Uh, not everybody writes um, a sort of focused treatise on government or something like we would want, but it will just be sprinkled in there. Um, but those are some of the, the sources I think are really, have been helpful to me to get a, get a handle on some of this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's super helpful. I definitely want to get into all of that. I think particularly the sermons, like in for lay audience, yeah. I think that'd be very very helpful. Um, well, for the sake of time, we're actually going to skip the what we're reading section this week. <laughs> um, but 
Jimon, thank you so much for, for coming on. We really enjoy this. I mean, I still have more and more questions about, about the subject and particularly app applications and early America, but um, thank you so much for coming on and kind of giving us a taste of what our tradition has to offer us. Um, where can people find you? Um, yeah, I guess just do the Twitter thing, right? T Lloyd Klein, Twitter. It's pretty much me, very awesome. online in that way. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, James. Thank you for for joining us as the as a, as a uh, one time co host. But uh, we'd love to see your face again. Um, thank you so much for th having me as the less important guest. I'm honored. Oh, it's that. it's all we'd love to have you on as less important guest more often. Um, you know, if you if you like the episode, make sure to uh, give us a like on the YouTube channel. Subscribe if you're listening on Spotify or Apple. Make sure to give us a five star review, and we'll catch you on the next time of the Ironic Protestant Podcast. <laughs>